Together, Michelson here with you. What we're going to do here today, we're going to chat politics, presidential politics during the first hour. Uh, we have uh, the honor of speaking with Senator uh, Rick Santorum, who's joined us in here in the studio after he selfishly decided to announce his presidency in another state at another time, as opposed to uh, far-thinking, foresighted politicians who announced their presidency on my program. What were you thinking, sir? This is the first Iowa program I've done. And I, I today announce I am running for president of the United States. I there. accept your apology. Okay, Thank you. you Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what, about two years ago, I was on a, a phone conversation on an Amtrak train. Yes. And when I got off the Amtrak train, I saw the almost the entire conversation blogged by someone sitting behind me in the in the Amtrak train. Wow. Uh, yeah. And so I thought, okay, no more. There is no such thing as a private conversation anymore. There's no zone of privacy. No zone eh? of privacy anymore. Uh, you should probably use alternative forms of communication. Should, Maybe you should Twitter should, or something. Should, oh, yeah. That's it. You know, I've heard that's safer. <laughs> A lot safer. As yeah. long as you keep your shirt on. Yeah, or, or other things on. Did he do anything criminal? That, to me, is, uh, you know, that'll be sorted out. But I think you got a window into the, to the kind of person that this guy is. And, uh, you know, character matters. And, uh, you know, I think people people need to uh, to assess whether, you know, uh, you know, we all have faults. We all do things we shouldn't do. Uh, but uh, the character of this man to uh, uh, to treat his uh, uh, this revelation the way he did, I think, is uh, was was as troubling as the revelation itself. You're running for an office, though, in which a foreign policy will be paramount. And as you well know, we're involved in a three front war now in Libya and we're part of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. I'm just trying to fit Libya into the North Atlantic. Are you having trouble fitting that into that part of the uh, world? I had trouble uh, when the president decided to do what he did. I, I, I thought it was a bad decision uh, that we should not be uh, deploying our military at the behest of the Arab League and the UN and uh, even our allies, uh, the, the French and the, and the British, uh, as much as you know, we want to be good allies, uh, we, we should not uh, get involved in activities unless there is a national security interest. And I think the president's uh, indecisiveness, and in, uh, he was for getting rid of Gaddafi, then against getting rid of Gaddafi, now he's for getting rid of Gaddafi. Uh, that, that's not leadership. It's not, uh, it's, not what, uh, 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 it's not what is in the best interest of our country. Is it even in the job description of NATO? Uh, well, I mean, the job description of NATO is obviously it's a security pact to uh, uh, to protect Western Europe. Well, you're all of Europe. It used to be Western Europe. Now Western and, and parts of Eastern Europe are, are involved in NATO. Uh, and uh, conceivably, could Libya uh, be a, a security issue? I think from the French perspective, they're concerned about, obviously, immigration, uh, massive waves of immigrants coming into France and uh, into uh, southern Europe. And so there I think they see that as a potential security interest for them. And so uh, not that's that's my uh, that's my you know uh, assessment whether um, uh, again, whether that rises to the level of whether we should be involved, uh, I would say at this point uh, the case hadn't been made. That, that was not an attack on Pakistan. It was an attack on a uh, uh, a someone who had a, attacked the United States and that, uh, we had made very clear to the Pakistanis. But it was but, labeled that, though. So. <clears throat> well, I understand that, the Chinese. But, um, you know, uh, the, the bottom line is that the, the Chinese are, uh, are beginning to flex their muscle. And there's a reason for that, because we're, we're creating a vacuum. We have a president who's created a vacuum in, in the world because he believes America is not a source of good, for good in the world, that uh, we should not uh, uh, involve ourselves in uh, in, uh, in supporting our friends and allies and to, and confronting uh, our, our enemies and and asserting America's will uh, that to me is is part of the Reagan doctrine it's uh, peace through strength and uh, we've seen uh, with this president that he has consistently done two things uh, every time an ally of ours was in trouble we have turned our back on them and we have either slapped them in the face like we did with Israel just recently or thrown them under the bus like we did with Mubarak, uh, or, uh, or, uh, or turned our backs on the Poles, the Czechs, uh, even the Brits when it came to the Falkland Islands, when the president went, when Hillary Clinton went down to Argentina and, and, and said that that was an open issue. I mean, this is, these are, this, it's time after time after time. Uh, this president has, uh, in the Colombians, the Hondurans, I can go on and on, uh, has, has uh, turned our back on our, our allies and friends to the point where they do not trust us anymore. And uh, that's created a vacuum. And on the other side, enemies of the United States, 
we have appeased, whether it's the Iranians and siding with, uh, with Ahmadinejad in the, uh, in the Green Revolution or whether it's slapping uh, Bashir Assad on the back of the wrist uh, for, uh, for killing hundreds and hundreds of his people, uh, while Mubarak, who didn't do anything close to that, was thrown under the bus. I mean, there's example after example. Again, Chavez, uh, an example in Venezuela. We, we are not... Uh, asserting America's, uh, you know, uh, interest in confronting these people. And, and so we do not have the respect of our enemies. And so you see an opportunity for Russia, for China, for India and for other countries to try to, uh, to, try to uh, take, take that role from the United States. Do you regard China as our enemy? I don't recall, re- regard them as our enemy. I, I don't see China as a, uh, uh, as a uh, I see them as a, strategic trading and economic partner they are we most are, favorite trade uh, status with them right we have we certainly have a a, a, a trading relationship but from the, from the standpoint of national security their the relationship with the iranians the relationships with the north koreans the hostility toward taiwan and japan mm-hmm. you know I, I don't think you can put them on yeah. the uh, you know the best friends list but at if, this point of america but the point is if they consider the united states going after terrorists that might be housed uh, knowingly or unknowingly in Pakistan, if they consider that an act of war against China, what should our response be? Uh, to I, China? I find I find that hard to believe, only because we routinely do uh, drone attacks in uh, in Pakistan, and we continue to do those. And so uh, I, I didn't I didn't see that quote, so I, I I'm sort of withhold judgment as to where it came from, okay. as to whether if you have that, as whether it can you know what level of official, you know, that matters in China. Right. It could be someone sort of popping off as I opposed understand. to uh, uh, something from the government. But uh, I, I, I find it hard to believe that uh, that they would see drone attacks in, in the mountainous regions in, in Pakistan as being an attack on China because we continue them today, and the Pakistanis don't consider it to be an attack on, on themselves. Uh, I saw a person a while back on Fox News, and he was ta- telling how our moral beliefs affect our foreign policy and how country looked at us. A recent example was the U.S. intervened in, uh, I, I think it was Kenya, in Africa, and we promoted $20 million to help them change their national constitution from a pro-life to a pro-choice. Doesn't that affect our foreign policy, too, how people perceive our beliefs, I mean, their beliefs, when we interfere in their, their beliefs? All right. Well, no, I, I think that's that's a great question, Joseph, and I, I would agree that, um, in uh, sadly, that we are promoting values through our uh, international actions that do not promote, you know, what is best about America. If you look at the, uh, this is the Kenyan situation. You look at the uh, effort that uh, has been put forward on AIDS. I was someone who was very active and involved in. And making sure that we did have a response to the AIDS pandemic in, in Africa because of the concern I had with um, with the states that we, you were just having massive numbers of people, the whole generations being wiped out, and would create a, an opportunity for uh, for for terrorists to to come in and and uh, you know do what they did to Afghanistan. So I saw a national security interest, and obviously you're talking about the scale of the pandemic there. You're talking about a, a, a humanitarian crisis. So I, I got involved in that. And one of the things that I did and one of the things I fought for was to make sure that the the values of the plans were consistent with the values of America, which is that we weren't going out there and, and promoting, um, you know, condom distribution and, and safe sex and all these things that uh, that that I, I think are antithetical to um, uh, to what the uh, uh, what the values of uh, of those nations. You know, Uganda is a good example were antithetical to the values of the of the cultures in those countries. And so, um, you know, that was that was a very important thing for me. And obviously, I, I have very strong feelings about those things as to what those values should be in this country. Obviously, there's a lot of controversy around that. But, it, but at least we should go out and, and be consistent in, in, in working with our aid with the values of the countries that we're working in. And that was not the case uh, until, until we I- injected that. I give President Bush a lot of credit for standing with me to make sure that those programs, particularly the American aid programs, were consistent in that regard. And, um, and I think you're right. We can send the wrong message. We do send the wrong message with our cultural. You know, look, at, look at the culture icons that we you know, transmit, Hollywood, and, and how they— 
represent what American values are. Uh, they certainly don't re- represent what Iowan values are. They may, uh, a, a, uh, you know, uh, in, in in certain elements of our society, but uh, it it does paint a picture of America that is uh, that is certainly not uh, consistent with. Uh, uh, what the values are in a lot of other areas of the world. Uh, when you announced your candidacy, you said we were losing our freedoms under President Obama. I was wondering if you could explain that. All right. Well, I've, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I was talking specifically in the announcement speech about Obamacare, and uh, President Obama ha- in this bill says that you are going to pay nine and a half percent of your income to the federal government, and here's the plan you're going to get. Everybody has to get it. Uh, you don't have you don't have any choice. You can get more. But the government's going to tell you what the minimum plan you have to get and, by the way, how you're going to get it. It's going to tell your employer what to do. It's going to tell doctors how much they're going to be paid. Uh, you just you go on down the list, and it's a very prescriptive way of, uh, of, uh, of providing health care, health insurance, and, and ultimately health care. And- In studio with me is Rick Santorum. He's running for president. I was just looking at the front page of the USA Today here, this, sir. U.S. owes $62 trillion. Uh, the unfunded obligations is about $535,000 per household. Uh, this is the, And the President yeah. of the United States says there's no problem. All we have to do is cut defense. Well, That's we, what he said. You're right. Right. All we have to do is cut defense and, and corporate and, and corporate welfare. And, and we have to end corporate welfare and tax rich people more. And I mean, it's it's dishonest to uh, to go out there to the American public and, and and not tell the truth about the severity of the problem we have now. Everyone says, oh, it's six years over time. It's now. It, the, if we don't begin to solve these problems now, <laughs> then the, the solutions that we're going to have, the, the medicine that we're going to have to take, it's like saying, OK, we have stage one cancer. We can wait. We can wait. There's treatments for stage four. We can wait. But does anybody want to have to go through stage four treatments to, and be, when you know that you're, it's going to become stage four if we do nothing? Why would we wait? Why, who would, you know, who as a society, if you're the leader of a society, who would look a cancer patient in the eye and say, America, I'm your doctor. I'm the leader. And I'm going to say to you, because if I tell you what you have to do, if I give you the treatment for stage one that I have to give you, you may not hire me as a doctor anymore because you may not like the treatment. And so I'm going to let you go to stage two and stage three just so I can get through my political term. I can, you know, I can, have, I can have my p- political power. I can, I can arrange the deck chairs the way I want to do it and then let someone else deal with stage two and stage three. This is... This is malpractice. Okay. It's the provision that was enacted back in the 80s for fed, retired federal employees, and it cut our Social Security by about a third because we were getting federal retirement checks. Right. It offset it, offset it from, uh, from your pension benefits. Exactly. Yeah. So my question is, is why couldn't this apply to everyone that's making over in retirement that's making, you know, let's say $100,000. And means testing. Yeah, means testing. Look, means testing is definitely on the table. It's going to have to be done. Um, and I've been very clear about that from the very beginning that, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, people were sold a bill of goods that Social Security was some sort of, you know, uh, that you had accounts at the Social Security Administration and you contributed and then you earned a benefit as a result of that. There's, frankly, that's not how Social Security works. And the idea that we have... Uh, you know, people who are you know very wealthy and uh, do not need Social Security benefits, uh, that they that they get um, uh, they get the same full benefit. Now, again, just so you understand, people who are higher income Social Security recipients do not get as generous a benefit right now as lower income. They get a lower percentage payback from the contributions they made than people who uh, who are lower income. Uh, they're called bend points. The higher the income, they, you know, they uh, the higher the income you have, the lower percentage. So it's there's, Social Security is already means tested. So what we need to do is further means tested. There's no, I mean that's <laughs> it's just, progressively taxed. It's it's progressively uh, taxed and, and then uh, deeper progressively benefited. Yeah, it's it is. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's and they want to make and they want to make it even more progressively taxed by lifting the cap off of it. So there's uh, this is a uh, uh, a system right now that uh, again um, I don't know if anyone would design the Social Security system and the way it's designed today if you were starting all over. Uh, but the fact is we're stuck with it. And uh, what we have to do is is try to make the most of it to make sure that we are providing a safety net for those who are in need in our society. Um, what I'd like to ask the senator is 
how he feels about raising tariffs on imported goods that we could easily make here in this country, which would uh, increase our manufacturing base and stop companies like Maytag from moving to Mexico to produce their goods. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more that uh, a policy of uh, going forward has to be to take the innovation that occurs here and transform it not just into intellectual property where uh, folks can, uh, you know, then you know, start this intellectual property and have all the manufacturing done offshore and make, a, you know, a few people make a lot of money and, 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 and not spread that money out through the, uh, through the manufacturing process. But the problem isn't, you know, putting tariffs and therefore taxing the American public with goods, the cost of goods that are coming into this country. The issue is here, how do we make our manufacturers more competitive? And uh, there's lots of things we can do to create a better environment for manufacturing, everything from litigation. Uh, if you look at, uh, I'm trying to remember the, uh, the name of the company, uh, just heard it yesterday, that has operations, similar size operations in three states, California, Texas, and Ohio. And their litigation cost, Texas did big litigation reform several years ago. Their litigation cost, 40% of their cost is in Ohio, 40% in California, 2% in Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, and guess where, they're, guess where they're expanding? They're expanding in Texas. So, right. so we need to, we, if there's a lot of things we can do from environmental regulatory po uh, policies to litigation policies to tax policy that will encourage businesses to grow their businesses here. Look at what the NLRB is doing under this president with uh, the South Carolina situation saying that if you don't, you know, if you're in a right to, if you're in a state that doesn't have right to work and you want to expand, you better not expand in a right to work state because we're going to shut you down. Uh, this is, this is telling manufacturers, I don't want to deal with this administration. I don't want to deal with the regulatory scheme that we have to, I'm going offshore. So we do lots of things to drive things offshore. Instead of putting a tax on the American people, which is what a tariff is, let's create policies that will, will build businesses here. But you're absolutely right. It, it is one of the highest priorities. If we're going to have wealth distributed throughout the economy, and I'm not talking about from the government, but distributed because of how the economy works, we've got to have manufacturing. We've got to have that, that, uh, that effect in our society to, have, to build a middle-income America. Rick I live down in Arizona where – we have a severe border problem where the illegals have come in and shut down most of our trauma level hospitals. What would you plan to do about that? Which is, it's really just a matter of will, uh, political will. You know, do we have the political will to uh, to secure the border? It's it's not a matter of money. It's not a matter of uh, you know of technology. It's a matter of deploying the resources that are necessary to make sure that this problem is no longer a problem. You know, and we just saw a Supreme Court today saying that California has to give in-state tuition to illegals. Uh, and you know this is this is creating a divide here in America. It's creating tension here in America that would go away if we say, you know what, Americans' borders are secure. So you're yeah. sitting there as president of the United States, and the Supreme Court just serves up this baloney. What do you do in response? <laughs> so we, we need to have the courage to say to the court, when they're wrong, you're wrong, and push back. That's number one. Number two, you know, uh, I've said, I think I maybe even said on this program, that, you know, if you look at the, the, uh, uh, the Constitution, it establishes how many courts? Uh, just the Supreme Court. That's it. That's right. It establishes one court. Who else? Who establishes the rest of the courts? Congress. That's right. So if we establish them, what can we do? This is that's exactly right. And there is there is a court. Do I, do I get a cookie? So far, I, you know, I, I sort of like being in the chair here. <laughs> can we switch chairs for a moment? This is sort of fun. Uh, that uh, that we should. And I I propose this. The Ninth Circuit is a rogue circuit. That is. Uh, that that is destroying the the judicial system. If it wasn't, if the Supreme Court could take more cases, they'd probably take every single case from the Ninth Circuit. The problem is they can't, and so there's so much bad law that the circuit is out rid there. Of, can get rid of courts that are rogue courts, and I think that's a rogue court. And we can establish. I think it's also too big of a court. We can take create two new circuits, or maybe even three circuits, out of what is the Ninth Circuit today, Got it. with all new judges. Okay. And the other thing you can do is obviously you can you can defend the Constitution, which the president didn't do with DOMA, and you can go out and articulate a uh, a much more uh, you know constitutionally consistent vision uh, as your attorney general and solicitor. Scheduled to visit this you. is a must stop. I'm glad I'm here. Oh, well, thank you for doing My so. My pleasure. Rick Santorum, our guest here, and you'll find his website at ricksantorum.com.